Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. This is lecture number 13, chapter 3. We are on page 30 and we are going to jump right back into the book. And just for a quick recap though, Holden is in conversation with Ackley. Okay, to the book. Your folks know you got kicked out yet? Nope. Where the hell's Stradletter at anyway? Down at the game. He's got a date, I yawned. I was yawning all over the place. For one thing, the room was too damn hot and made you sleepy. At Pincy, you either froze to death or died of the heat. So yeah, we see Ackley asking a question about Holden's parents, if they know he got kicked out, and instead of exploring that question further, he just moves on to the next thing, which is about Stradladder, who seems to consume Ackley's mind. He doesn't like him, but I think there's a sense of admiration and maybe even envy. We'll see that more so as we progress. Then Holden's tired, which he may be bored of the conversation as well. And the last sentence, I think, is alluding to the fact that Holden's never comfortable at Pensy. He's never been comfortable in regards to saying he, you either froze to death or died of the heat. And both are very uncomfortable, right? So perhaps he's never been actually comfortable at this high school. Move on to the next passage. The Great Stride Ladder, Ackley said. Hey, lend me your scissors a second, will ya? You got them handy? No, I packed them already. They're way in the top of the closet. Give them a second, will ya? Ackley said. I got this hangnail I want to cut off. So first off, we see Ackley actually using some sarcasm when he says the Great Stride Ladder. Therefore, we can assume that he's not completely ignorant of sarcasm. Though, there may be some truth in this. You may actually think that Shred Letter is great, but I will let you have an opinion yourself as we progress to see if you do think that Ackley does think Shred Letter is great. And I think it's quite humorous that Ackley doesn't care that he's being an inconvenience. I mean, clearly he doesn't mind being an inconvenience or being a, a nuisance, pestering someone. Therefore, when Holden is clearly trying to hint that it's a problem that he packed them already and they're all the way at the top of the closet. Is it really necessary? He's still asking for it. Right? He doesn't care if it's going to be an inconvenience for anyone. And I think this is this is just Ackley's character, the way he's been portrayed and will continue to, to be portrayed. And lastly, I want to pose the question to you is why do you think that Ackley's so obsessed with the cleanliness of his fingernails. It's odd. Why do you think that? What are some things you do with your fingernails? I mean, dig, scratch. I think he pops his pimples a lot with them, but why would he want them clean? I haven't really figured that out. Maybe you, maybe you know, but yeah, I can't seem to figure it out. If you do figure it out, leave it in the comments. To the next passage. He didn't care if he packed something or not and had it way in the top of the closet. I got them for him though. I nearly got killed doing it too. The second I opened the closet door, Stradladder's tennis racket and its wooden press and all fell right on my head. It made a big clunk and it hurt like hell. Damn near killed old Ackley though. So why did Holden get it for Ackley? It is odd. It's an inconvenience, but yet Holden still gets out, goes out of his way to get it from. And nearly, you know, he hurts himself in the process. Not severely, but he does injure himself doing this for Ackley. He doesn't even fight back about like, well, I don't want to do it because it's an inconvenience, he just does it. Maybe he knows that the fight's not worth it. But what do you think? I also want to point out the numerous references to death, which is an, a common motif throughout this book. Nearly got killed, damn near, near killed Ackley. And you will see him referencing death multiple times, as we have constantly seen throughout this book, right? Even if he's not referencing it specifically, we see it in in an earlier passage earlier chapter when we figured out about the the dorm being named i think ausenberger yes named after ausenberger who made his riches off undertaking so there's just common themes of death throughout because obviously death is a part of life okay to the next passage he started laughing in this very high falsetto voice. He kept laughing the whole time. I was taking down my suitcase and getting the scissors out for him. Something like that. A guy getting hit on the head with a rock or something. He tickled the pants off Ackley. You have a damn good sense of humor, Ackley kid. I told him. You know that? I handed him the scissors. Let me be your manager. I'll get you on the goddamn radio. So Ackley's not even concerned about the health of Holden. Like he's not asking if he's all right, just laughing. 
<clears throat> which I think, and it makes it worse because he has a terrible laugh, which we would expect Ackley to have, right? He's just this unappealing guy. He's repulsive in every aspect, personality-wise, his physical appearance, and then on top of that, he has an annoying laugh. So it just seems fitting for his character. We also get a, a look on what into uh, Ackley's sense of humor, because it seems as if their sense of humor differs, and we know what makes Holden laugh. And here, Ackley seems to be more into like slapstick comedy. He'd be a fan of the Three Stooges, or like Charlie Chaplin. Then we have Holden being sarcastic, right? <clears throat> Telling him he has a good sense of humor and that he'll be his manager and whatnot. Yeah, he'll get him on the radio. To the next passage, I sat down in my chair again and he started cutting his big horny looking nails. How about using the table or something? I said, cut him over the table, will ya? I don't feel like walking on your crummy nails and my bare feet tonight. You can't fret on cutting them over the floor though. What lousy manners, I mean it. Here we have Holden practically explicitly stating what he wants Ackley to do, but he still forms it in a question. The same way that Ackley formed what he wanted in the question about getting the scissors when he says, will you do it? And then how about you use a table or something with a question mark and come over a table, will you? And he tells him he doesn't feel like why he doesn't want that, but Ackley's just ignoring him, right? He has no courtesy, no respect, and it's true. And we see it already that he just doesn't mind inconveniencing anybody. And perhaps this is another reason why Ackley doesn't have any friends, because he lacks common courtesy, he doesn't have any basic manners, doesn't really seem to care for others. And so he's just probably just an annoying character that no one wants to be around. Holden called him rotten, and it, it kind of seems that way. All right, to the next passage. Who's Stradladder's date, he said. He was always keeping tabs on who Stradladder was dating, even though he hated Stradladder's guts. I don't know why. No reason. Boy, I can't stand that son of a bitch. He's one son of a bitch I really can't stand. When you dislike someone strongly, maybe even to the point of feeling like you hate them, they just consume your thoughts, right? All your energy is expended on them. You're constantly thinking of them, which is odd. Do you have anybody like that in your own life that you disliked or in the past? And just some celebrities, like for instance, uh, someone that absorbs so many people's thoughts is for Trump, for instance, right? So many people can't stand them and then they're just constantly spending so much time and energy and constantly want to keep tabs on him. He's always on the news. To the next passage. He's crazy about you. He told me he thinks you're a goddamn prince, I said. I call people a prince quite often when I'm horsing around. It keeps me from getting bored or something. So sarcasm once again. From Holden saying that Ackley is a good, he thinks Ackley is a goddamn prince, which Stradletter does, and he even calls people a prince when he says he's horsed around, so it's just when he's joking around and being sarcastic. And Holden resorts to sarcasm or, you know, horsing around to keep him from getting bored. He's mentioned it already a few times, and I think he mentions it, mentions it as the story progresses. It's, it's a way to keep himself amused with life, right? And like I said, from keep keeps them from being bored. We often use humor to shield ourselves from boredom or more specifically any kind of misery, right? It's best to, to laugh about it. I think the best comedy comes from a place of, you know, suffering or it's not, happy comedy is not really great, I don't think. Personally, I don't think so. Um, who are you, some of your favorite comics? Um, personally, I really love Tim Dillon, if you know him, but his is more of the cynical kind of comedy. I also think that this is another way that Holden keeps himself amused with interaction. If someone is, let's say, quite boring to speak with, or you just, you feel like you have to be around them, you try to make the things fun and amuse yourself, even if the other individual doesn't really get it. Perhaps you're at a work event or you have to go to a family holiday event, whatever it is. And it's typically not too fun, but the only way you make it fun is if you entertain yourself and are doing these sort of things where 
you're being sarcastic a lot of the times, or you, you're watching back and finding things amusing, having jokes in your own head to keep things interesting and light. Next passage. He's got this superior attitude all the time, Ackley said. I just can't stand the son of a bitch. You think he... Do you mind cutting your nails over the table? Hey, I said. I've asked you about 50. He's got this goddamn superior attitude all the time, Ackley said. I don't even think the son of a bitch is intelligent. He thinks he is. He thinks he's about the most. Ackley, for Christ's sake, will you please cut your crummy nails over the table? I've asked you 50 times. He started cutting his nails over the table for a change. The only way he ever did anything was if you yelled at him. So in this passage, we see them both interrupting one another, right, constantly. Holden won't let Ackley talk about Stradladder and say his thoughts on him, which is interesting. And I think also Ackley's kind of a hypocrite here because he has an attitude of superiority, right? He's been portraying that constantly throughout this. And so does Holden. We all, I mean, we all do to some degree. And here we see them two battling it out, which is interesting. And, Ackley's constantly trying to assert his own superiority and dominance in his interactions with Holden as, you have, as we have seen he ignores Holden's commands he does things to purposely annoy Holden if Holden asks him to do something he doesn't listen and like Ackley said the only time he well like Holden said the only time Ackley listens to him is when he is assertive yells because he probably cowers down I don't think Ackley's someone who has any bravery or courage if if he had a fight, for instance, if it got to that, uh, any sort of confrontation, it seems like he'll be the kind of individual that would back down, like we see here. And we'll see something else a little later, which I will, I will refer to this. And I also want to point out there's a, there's a switch in the common slang terms. I don't know if you picked this up, and I want to ask you if you think there's any significance to the switch. Ackley says Holden's word which with goddamn. He's always saying goddamn. And Ackley has been saying Christ's sake, but now Holden says Christ's sake. He says Ackley for Christ's sake. And when he finally speaks his language, right, Ackley's language for the Christ's sake, and now Ackley listens. Of course he yells, so maybe that's part of the combination, but it is interesting that once he speaks his language, uses his words, Ackley listens. We also see Holden going through, you know, the standard it's not completely standard, but he is trying to do what you're supposed to do with the social conventions of how you're supposed to dress another individual when you want them to do something, right? Without being completely rude or being explicit, without explicitly stating what you want them to do, like he did at the end. He, he lost his temper. He was trying to be polite by trying to be passive in a way and it just didn't work. And I don't think it works with a guy like Ackley. And it doesn't work with some people you meet, right? There's some individuals where you, you can't be passive, that you must take an active approach. Otherwise, the individual will just continue to just walk all over you or do whatever they want. And I think Ackley's that character as well. I also think it's significant because Holden, he rarely tells you exactly what he wants. He will mostly pose things as a question or will be passive about it. And therefore, it leaves something open. Like, when Holden says, do you mind cutting your nails over the table, hey? Then Ackley could, in his mind, think like, I do mind. I don't want to cut my nails over the table. Because he's not telling him not to, right? It's as, he's putting the ball in his court, for using that cliche. I just think Ackley's is very discourteous. And maybe this is a lesson to Holden that he has to learn to command and not ask. To be direct instead of trying to lessen the harshness of a desire by posing it as a question. Which is what he does here. And many of us do and Holden does it quite often as we we may have already seen this in previous chapters and then we will see it as the book progresses and you may do this as well I know I do I'm naturally very passive in my you know, disposition I'm too agreeable for doing the big five personality trait it's one of my flaws and it's hard because you don't want to appear bossy. I know some individuals do not mind, but I never want to appear bossy. Therefore, I try to do something well, similar to what Holden does, which is hinting at something and hoping that someone will catch the hand. But I'm trying not to do that as much because it is annoying if you're on the other side, right? You'd rather someone just be direct. I don't know, what do you think? I kind of, I appreciate when someone's just direct with me rather than hinting at it. Because you just want to be like, I know what you want me to do, just tell me, instead of hinting at it. 
I don't know. I think we all differ. Next passage. I watched him for a while. Then I said, the reason you're sore at stride ladder is because he said that stuff about brushing your teeth once in a while. He didn't mean to insult you for crying out loud. He didn't say it right or anything, but he didn't mean anything insulting. All he meant was you'd look better and feel better if you sort of brushed your teeth once in a while. So we have Holden watching Ackley to ensure that he's not going to go back to cutting his nails, right? Not over the table like he asked him to. He's, so he, we have him not trust him completely yet. And once he, he realizes, okay, Ackley's doing what I asked him to do, he goes on to talk. While reading this passage, did you pick up the uncertainty in Holden's language. There's quite a bit. It seems as if he's trying to find his words and he's attempting to be empathetic. I, at least I picked that up. He didn't want to hurt Ackley's feelings and he doesn't want to say the wrong things. Perhaps you have been in this situation where you're trying to find the words, right? And you're, it feels as if you're walking through landmines. You don't want to say one thing that's going to trigger the person to either have their feelings hurt or they're going to zone in on that and then combat that argument, right? That happens quite often. Like here, he may be looking for Holden to say one thing in which Ackley can refute because he doesn't want to change his opinion. And no one ever wants to. If you're trying to persuade someone, it's never really going to work. Someone has to, someone has to come about it them, themselves. The more you try to persuade someone to change their opinions about a person or a thing, whatever it may be, the individual like stands more firm and holds on to it even even stronger without really relinquishing their grip because they don't want to be proven wrong right it's just it's this odd thing but i think that it doesn't work it doesn't ever work rarely maybe you have an, an example but it's, it's challenging right? no matter you can say everything great but most of the time people aren't looking for their views to be changed instead they're trying to look for the views to be confirmed. I mean, it's easier than ever now, right? With modernity and you could just look up things and have confirmation bias. But even when someone's arguing with you and you're having a debate, most people will not be listening to what the other person's saying. They're not trying to do the strong man arguments, right? They're looking for the straw man, looking for an argument that you say in which they can refute so they can hold on to their views and say, no, I'm right. Look, this is the reason I'm right. Look at this reason. Who cares about all the other reasons you present? I'm not paying attention to those. Right, it's frustrating, but I'm sure you've been that 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 annoying person who's been very stubborn. I I try to be open, but I know that even in I'm high in openness, but even then, sometimes I cling to my reasons for doing things. And also, when you do say something that, let's say, that Holden said the wrong word that hurt. Ackley's feelings, he will immediately close his mind, right, and shut off and not want to listen to anything that Holden has to say because he feels insulted, right, and wounded, so then he'll shield himself. And I think that Holden understands this. It's, Holden has some wisdom the way he deals with people, the same way we saw him deal with Spencer. He has this empathy. He, he understands and he's still trying to navigate, but I think even though he's young, they're, they're clearly, he clearly understands people, even in this kind of primitive, ignorant way. Just the fact that he, he understands that he must show tact in this interaction is a sign of his wisdom, right? He's being considerate of Ackley's feelings, which is always interesting because Ackley's not considerate of his feelings at all, right? Not considerate if he's about his room or if he's going to step on his nails or if he gets hurt by dropping that tennis racket on his head while getting scissors for Ackley. And the same way that Holden was very considerate to not want to hurt Mr. Spencer's feelings, but Mr. Spencer was not considerate at all in regards to Holden's feelings. And so we're, we're seeing this uh, transpire in front of us. Hopefully as we continue to read and we meet more characters, in this story, perhaps they will be kinder to Holden, hopefully, and reciprocate his own considerateness or his own consideration. And I also want to point out that Holden has some character here 
because he's not disagreeing with Ackley in order to, to try to maintain positive relations with him, which sometimes we do, right? Instead, he is defending Stradlatter without trying to insult Ackley at the same time. So he's not talking bad about Stradlatter behind his back, which is a testament to his character because I think it's, it's frequent for people to just agree with someone or if they're hearing someone talk badly about another individual, they don't ever really defend them, right? They kind of just stay quiet because they don't want to have the confrontation and it's easier just to remain quiet, even if you don't agree. And he's also trying to help Ackley see that Stradlatter didn't mean it in a mean way. It's just Ackley's own insecurity, right? It seems that way that caused him to find it insulting. And in addition for his own dislike of Stradlatter, he's probably intimidated by Stradlatter because we will find out Stradlatter's kind of the, you know, the all-American boy. He's handsome, uh, he has an athletic build, he's, athlete, he's a star athlete, he's popular. So he's like that kid and Ackley's the complete opposite, right? So he's already in, probably insecure around him, envious of him, and he also admires them because when you envy someone, you admire them, even if you don't like them, right? And him saying anything to Ackley, he's already insecure anytime he's around him because he sees Stradladder and then he sees himself and it just allows him to be more aware of his own flaws and his insufficiencies. And so when he points something out, he immediately takes it as an insult. But Stradlatter probably didn't mean it that way. And Holden understands that. And he's trying to alter Ackley's perspective by looking at it from a different perspective, which is huge because I think that's something we're not afforded in in a first person narrative because we're only we are only getting a story from one person's perspective so it's going to be skewed hence why there's the common idea that Holden is an unreliable narrator and we all are in our lives right when we when we recount a story we are always telling it from our own perspective. And by doing that, we, we paint that story a different color than someone else would if they're telling that same story. I also want to continue with this idea about when someone we dislike says something negative, it typically comes off far more harsh because we perceive it in a negative manner and like a venomous tone, right? We believe the worst of their intentions because we don't like them, right? Even if it wasn't meant that way, but we're blinded by our own feelings towards someone, which I think Ackley is to Stradlatter. And it's the same with the opposite, right? People who, when people like somebody, they're blinded by their intentions as well. They're always expecting the best. So it goes both ways. And hence why people say love is blind, right? Which it is. And that can always be bad too, right? Or if someone has a terrible friend, but they constantly think the best out of them, they don't really see the true intentions, how the friend might be malicious to them. And here, Stradler could have really just been trying to help him out in a kind manner, but didn't know how to say it because it's hard to tell somebody like, your teeth are, you should brush your teeth. It's going to come off kind of rude no matter what, but I don't think that was his intention. And Holden understands intention, tone, body language. He's more perceptive, perceptive, than his fellow peers thus far. Far more perceptive than Ackley and miles more perceptive than Mr. Spencer. He was completely blind and ignorant of, of social interaction, right? And we know Ackley is as well because he's socially awkward, has no friends. And Mr. Spencer, he was a lonely old man. And I think people have to be perceptive of another individual because body language is, I don't know what the percentage is. I don't even know how they landed on that, but we all know that body language, tone of voice, these are far more important than the words that are actually being said. We often focus far more on the words and not the intentions behind the words. And that makes communication just far more sloppy and become, it, it just becomes misunderstood. And it's unfortunate because miscommunication plagues the world, plagues social interactions, right? Social relationships, it's quite, quite unfortunate. 
And I think it's interesting that Stratlander focuses in on Ackley's physical appearance and not his personality, but we will see why when he appears because Stradladder's sole concern is the appearance, the physical appearance of individuals and himself, primarily himself, but he focuses on the world of appearances. And lastly, we see Holden trying to lessen the remark of Stradladder, and he's trying to help him out again here when he says, all he meant was you'd look better and feel better if you sort of brush your teeth once in a while, instead of saying like you should be brushing your teeth. It's like he's trying to lessen that statement. And maybe just by putting it out there, Ackley may take it in and actually do it and not think of it as so like a criticism that's harsh. So the next passage, I brush my teeth. Don't give me that. No, you don't. I've seen you and you don't. I said, I didn't say it nasty though. I felt sort of sorry for him in a way. I mean, it isn't too nice naturally if somebody tells you you don't brush your teeth. And here I loved Ackley's response. It's very amusing. When you read it, did you laugh? I had a nice little chuckle. And then Holden alludes to the tone of the voice when he says, I didn't say it nasty. Which is something that he needs to tell us because we can't pick that up, right? When we're reading it in text, you can't pick up the tone of voice, which is unfortunate. And that is something that's very common. And you may have had this, you may have a multitude of examples in your own personal life when you send emails or text messages and they get misconstrued, right? Or you misconstrue a message, vice versa. I know that's happened many times when you say something and somebody thinks like you, you're being rude with what you said, but you don't mean it that way. Emojis can help, but it's still very challenging, right? You lose, you lose the body language and the tone of voice when it's all digitally, it's all digitally written, or if you see just text on a paper, right? You're gonna put your own perception perceptions on it and it's going to skew the message completely which yeah is dangerous something's even worse now especially i think because the world is in the pc world is that a conversation can be can be had in a certain setting and it's not it's not bad and it's all fine but if it's taken out of context for instance some, what someone said in that conversation that would have been just playful and friendly it, it could come off really wrong, right? And I think there's many examples of that. Also, what's interesting is Holden felt sort of sorry for Ackley the same way he felt sort of sorry for Mr. Spencer. So the two people he's met thus far and conversed with, excluding Mrs. Spencer, he felt, he felt sort of sorry for, which is interesting. He's pitying these people that he's meeting. And that's interesting because Holden himself is struggling mentally and emotionally he he lost a brother and not only that he's flunking out of school and he's flunked out of many schools and yet he still feels sorry for these people right which is interesting because shouldn't he be the one that people feel sorry for or pity and like i mentioned Previously, I think Holden's correct in his, his assertion and that it's not typically considered nice to tell someone that they should brush their teeth, right? Like, you don't brush your teeth, that's kind of rude. It hurts people's egos. Because it's practically telling the person that they, their teeth look bad or they're dirty or they smell, right? It's awkward. If you ever had to tell somebody something of that nature, even if you're trying to help them, I... I think my sister or brother had an employee who would go to baseball practice or some sport and he would come into work and he wouldn't shower and he would smell and customers would complain. So she had to have the off conversation afterwards and be like, hey, um, yeah, you need to shower, right? But he has, it's helping him out, but it is an awkward conversation to have. Furthermore, I wanna ask you this question, is it, are you doing an individual more harm by trying to like shield them and pity them? Because I think pity is a cruel evil and perhaps you're doing them far more harm than if you just said the thing directly, right? Because pitying them just, I think allows a person to remain a victim. 
In regards to the hero's journey, Ackley, it doesn't seem like he's the companion to help. We mentioned that in the previous lecture, but I mean, I think it's very clear. It seems as if Holden's trying to help Ackley the same way he was trying to hold, help Mr. Spencer out, right? He's trying to do more of the assisting than they are to him. And it'd be nice if they had the the typical relationship that many, you know, quote unquote bros have with one another. I'm not familiar with girl relationships and friends, but for guys, when you have a group of a group of like bros, you guys can tease each other all the time, and it's nice because you guys know that you care about one another. You know when to build each other up and when to to just tease and poke fun, or he you can make this funny in a joke about his teeth. But they don't have that relationship, right? They're both insecure, especially Ackley, which is unfortunate. To the next passage, Strad letters are right. He's not too bad, I said. You don't know him, that's the trouble. Holden, once again, wise in his youth here, right? Once you get to know someone on a more personal level, you realize that they're not that bad, they're human beings. There's things you're gonna, going to dislike about them, there's going to be things that you like about them. No one's all perfect, no one's all bad. And I'm sure you have many examples in your own life, people you may have strongly disliked or someone that you know on a more personal level and everyone else finds them just repulsive or they can't stand them and you're like, they're not that bad actually. If you got to know them, they're, they're actually kind of cool or they're kind of funny or you get an inside peek into their lives and maybe they opened up and shared something with you and you realize more about them and understand them. And you're like, okay, I get why you act this way sometimes. It's not excusing their behavior, but I'm sure you understand this, right? Next passage. I still say he's a son of a bitch. He's a conceited son of a bitch. He's conceited, but he's very generous in some things. He really is, I said. Ackley has repeatedly called Stradletter a son of a bitch. He seems to have one idea of what Stradletter is, and that is what he is clinging on to and holding on to. He can't, un he can't see Stradletter as a human being, meaning he's complex and has many different personalities and traits. Instead, he believes he has one character trait, one personality, and that's just him being a son of a bitch. And that simplifies Stradladder for him in the world, right? Most people want to stereotype someone or just think that someone is one thing and only one thing because that makes the world easier. It's too hard for many people to know that Everyone is, you know, a character from Leo Tolstoy's books when they're complex because human beings are complex. And we see that Holden understands this once again more. And another indication that Holden does have some wisdom and knowledge about people. He knows that people are, are complex beings. They have multiple traits. They're multifaceted. They have many sides, right? Good and bad. And there's good qualities and bad qualities. He, he is conceited, but he also is generous in some things. Also, Holden emphasizes that he's telling the truth here when he says that he's very generous in some things. He really is. We see this often when Holden is trying to convince the other individual of that what he's saying is true. Even if it's a lie, but here I believe it's true. What are your thoughts? I believe he is attempting to persuade Ackley to look at Stradlader and in a different light to see him from a different perspective and to understand that he has many sides and he's not just a son of a bitch right he's not just conceited but his word isn't good enough as we know for because he he, he doesn't think his word is good enough at the moment and i think one of the reasons is because he does lie frequently and if you're someone that lies quite often you don't even believe your own word. You feel like someone else, if you can't believe your own word, then how is someone else, right? Because you're constantly lying. If you're someone who constantly tells the truth, then you're gonna feel confident in what you say and it's going to, you're gonna say it with confidence and you're not worried about someone else perceiving it as a lie. And lastly, in regards to Ackley and his judgment of Stradladder, if we view people as a whole, they're going to be falling in line with Ackley, right? People make form initial judgments of other individuals and they it's hard for them to ever break that judgment. That's why first impressions are so are so powerful and so important because once you form a, an impression on someone, 
they're going to hold on to that and that they're always going to look at you through that lens, that initial lens. They can be persuaded over time, but it's a lot more difficult, right? Versus if you put on, if you make a good impression at first, they're naturally going to see you every single time from that positive light. And it's easier to show your good sides, right? They're always going to notice that more than that bad side of you. But think bad of you, then they're always going to focus on all your negative traits and react when they see you with you know, a negative energy and you're going to react back at them in a negative energy and it's just going to make this impression of you persist in their eyes, right? And it's also challenging to change someone else's opinions of someone, no matter how much evidence you, you give them or how much, right? You wanna give them a bunch of details and stories, but unless that individual experiences it themselves, they're not really going to change. He could say the most marvelous story and extraordinarily kind and generous story of Stradladder. And the likelihood of it changing Ackley's opinion of him are slim. Unless Ackley experienced it for himself, was there when it happened, right? Got to see this other side of Stradladder, he's not going to change. Don't you agree? And we're going to leave off there and we will pick it up on the next lecture on page 33. Thank you for listening. Bye.